moving on to our next speaker uh, her topic for today is uh, dysbiosis and its connection to autoimmunity she is none other than dr kalpana shikhawat an integrative metabolic medicine consultant and a leading functional medicine specialist of the country she has uh, post graduated from cncb clinical nutrition certificate board texas usa and also specialized in bhrt Uh, she has introduced peptide therapy after further training from peptide therapy foundation and a4m uh, a4m usa as well she specializes in handling immune system related disorders such as diabetes autoimmune diseases which involve a wide spectrum of diseases such as hashimotos chronic fatigue syndrome ibs ibd parkinsons multiple sclerosis and cancers uh, she is uh, she is going to talk about dysbiosis and its connection to autoimmunity uh, over to you ma'am thank you so much uh, dr karishma for this wonderful introduction and i um good afternoon everyone and i wish to thank the entire team of iafm for uh, creating this platform and bringing such great health pioneers uh, under one platform to share discuss and uh, you know uh, expand their knowledge so thank you so much for this and um, my topic today so uh, do we want uh, do you want to share or i should try to share my content uh, karishma yeah, you can try from your my... side yeah you can try from your side yes. if, if it does not happen i'll share it for sure yes uh, i'm just trying to do it just give me a moment i'll do it i guess you have joined from the mobile right Yeah, no uh, yeah 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 so i think that this is not happening i'll i do it i'll do uh, okay it. you you go ahead and please for me yes yes, yes. i do can you please unshare the screen oh yes yes thank you so much can you see my screen yes i can see it okay yes i'm sorry but you will have to flip for me when yeah, yeah, i yeah. need it absolutely but absolutely fine yeah that's why we are here for that please yeah, thank you so much uh, so we um, so today my topic of discussion is uh, how dysbiosis uh, is connected to autoimmunity because i've been doing a lot of research on this and i've been seeing a lot of patients who are coming and um, perpetually in um, 90 to 90 95% of these patients i always found some so sort of uh, uh, irregularity in their uh, gastrointestinal tract microbiome and um, and of course they have the related symptoms to it uh, so that really led me to think that i think uh, while we are trying to address the root causes of uh, autoimmunity and um, Uh, you know we we are, we are different from the conventional medicine when they are just giving immunosuppressants or their last resorts are steroids and uh, so patients come to us and they say that for how long can we keep taking steroids and they are causing side effect they are dealing with side effects of these steroids and it's big life is becoming more and more difficult for them so they they would want to address the root causes so we start looking for the root causes so apart from multiple other root causes i mean uh, uh, this is one of the things which develops and when we start this and we see really great improvements in our patients you know uh, in uh, we've seen uh, in our patients of hashimotos thyroiditis um, that uh, their um, uh, po and ntdg levels uh, from 4000 have come down to 4 or something uh, just by correcting their gut microbiome and uh, removing the the threats which basically are uh, preventing any kind of healing in their gut so we all know autoimmune diseases are on the rise and they are posing a significant health concern nowadays and there's a growing re realization that our immune system is a system tuning with gut my gut's microbial environment which is often dysbiotic is a key player in the health issues in this health issue so research points to a strong link between disturbances in the balance of gut microbiome microorganisms and development of autoimmune disorders essentially the microbes in our gut seem to influence our uh, how our immune system behaves understanding this connection is vital for untangling the complexities of autoimmune diseases and holds promise for developing new and effective treatments uh, can can we just go back to the previous slide yeah so i already spoke yeah yeah you already that's good yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, so the most common autoimmune diseases, like we can see in uh, in this paper, are uh, so Hashimoto's is very common, Graves' disease, rheumatoid arthritis, vitiligo, type one diabetes, 
pernicious anemia, anemia multiple sclerosis, SLE, Sjogren's, and myositis. Uh, and if you see clearly, there is uh, there is an there is. Uh, uh, just uh, Sorry, just one second. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody is. Please uh, mute yourself, panelists. It's a request. Yeah, please go ahead, ma'am. Please. Yeah. So, so we can see here that uh, there is a dominant uh, trend uh, for female population to be getting more of these autoimmune diseases, and there seems to be some uh, relation with the hormones that they have. Now, uh, which is which is yet to be established. So there are not so many papers, but there there is speculation that it's a possibility that uh, hormones are involved in this uh, process, and uh, so female hormones have more um, inclination to you know for them to get autoimmunity, and especially it happens, uh, you know, it's uh, mostly manifested after 30, 35 years of age. And when we know that our progesterone and, uh, you know, many other hormones, they start dropping. Cortisol also is one of the factors. Now, uh, if you want to talk about how common are these autoimmune diseases, it's very difficult to know because we really do not have a mechanism in place. In fact, there is, uh, to, there is no way to systematically collect this data uh, about the prevalence and incidence of autoimmune diseases as it exists for um, infectious and cancer diseases and for uh, you know, diabetes and all, we are still able to get some data. The primary reason is that, uh, you know, this uh, autoimmune disease diagnosis is very um, kind of uh, superficial. They uh, solely go on basis of certain markers that they check and then they um, label the patient as uh, having autoimmune disease. But in our practice, we are able to um, really identify the underlying causes and we go relate them with the uh, symptoms we know that the patient is undergoing autoimmunity even in uh, post covid we have seen so many patients who have um, autoimmune issues and obviously they are not called autoimmune patients by the conventional medicine uh, but uh, we know that there is uh, molecular mimicry or uh, uh, there are those antibodies which are acting against your own organs so um, so it's very difficult really to know exactly how uh, you know how big the this population of autoimmune patients is next um so there's this paper which says increasing prevalence of autoimmune diseases calls for an urgent action so we all know that that even if they are not diagnosed we see a lot of people um oh. we, we, sorry, I, I, is, there, is there anything um yeah, it's fixed it's fixed please go ahead yeah so immune system is unable to, so what happens in autoimmunity is when immune system is unable to differentiate between healthy cells and invading microorganisms. And to a large extent, our thymus gland also has a role to play in this, which we are going to talk about as we move ahead. Next, please. So the common reasons for this surge are human genetic. So we know human genetics have not altered over the past few decades. So what has changed is the epigenetics and uh, epigenetic environment. So we really know that twenty uh, whatever most of these diseases which are called genetic have twenty percent genetic element and they are eighty percent uh, environmental or epigenetic. And uh, so uh, as rightly said uh, by our uh, mentors that. Uh, that, uh, you know, genetics, they load the gun and epigenetics, they shoot it. So that's exactly what's happening uh, in current times. And we are seeing that stressful lifestyle, unhealthy food choices, EMF exposure, environmental pollutants, pesticides, chemicals, they all are contributing to um, disruption of the gut microbiome and a constant chronic inflammation, which is what it is. Next, please. So imbalance in the microbiome is an activator for autoimmune disease. Gut microbiota, they affect the immune system, uh, systems perform, uh, and they perform many metabolic processes and synthesize vitamins while aiding nutrient digestion when they are healthy. Imbalances in the microbiome can trigger diseases, including autoimmune conditions, despite its crucial role in human health. And that's only because of the imbalance. Otherwise, we definitely need our healthy microbiomes to be in place. Next. So here's this slide, which is basically, um, which is basically depicting symbiosis, dysbiosis, and leaky gut syndrome. Uh, so this is how it develops. We can see that 
uh, you know, um, when there are when there are threats and their ep uh, epithelial lining is broken down, and we are seeing that there are leaks which develop gradually over a period of time, and these tight junctions are broken, and uh, we see these antigens antigens crossing you know, the barrier, the gastrointestinal tract barrier, and getting into the bloodstream and evoking an immune response, which literally goes random, and uh, it it does not have the direction. Uh, that it should not be attacking the regular uh, the um, uh, the body organs, and uh, that is how uh, an exaggerated immune response basically leads to setting in of immunity. And this can be caused by food and environmental born viruses, bacteria, fungus. They can lead to dysbiosis, leading to inflammation and possibly autoimmunity. Due to alterations in the microbiome, this has been observed in multiple studies. Next, please. Can we go to next? Yeah. So dysbiosis can trigger autoimmunity through several mechanisms. So uh, it has been proposed that there are, uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. This one, yeah. right? Yeah. This, yeah. Yes. So molecular mimicry is one. Dysbiosis can lead to the production of antibodies that, uh, uh, that cross react with host tissues due to similarities between microbial and human proteins. So, so there is, the, so they, 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 they are not unable to recognize the difference between human proteins and the microbial proteins and uh, they start attacking the human um, cells. Inflammation and imbalanced microbiota can trigger chronic inflammation, which can contribute to the uh, development of autoimmune diseases. Next, please. Altered immune response. Dysbiosis can modify the immune response by promoting pro-inflammatory responses and inhibiting regulatory T cells. Then leaky gut, which is a common hypothesis that dysbiosis can result in increased gut permeability. Um, and it's been uh, established in many papers also that there is definitely a change in gut permeability whenever there is huge dysbiosis in, our pa in uh, patients, allowing the passage of antigens and toxins into the bloodstream, potentially triggering autoimmune reactions. Next, please. Next mechanism... Mm, sorry, next, yeah. uh, last one. It is, yes. Yeah. So the next, next mechanism could be modulation of immune cells. So gut bacteria can influence the differentiation and function of immune cells. And dysbiosis can alter this balance, leading to the activation of immune cells and uh, that are involved in autoimmunity. Nutrient absorption and, uh, met, uh, and metabolism. So dysbiosis can affect nutrient absorption and metabolism in the gut, and this can lead to nutritional deficiencies, which are in turn may impact the immune system and contribute to autoimmune diseases. Next. So uh, common autoimmune diseases, which have been found to, linked, uh, to be linked with dysbiosis are, I forgot to mention Hashimoto's, which is very, very common, which we see very commonly in our uh, patients. And uh, otherwise, inflammatory bowel disease, very, very common. It could be uh, could begin with syndrome. And uh, uh, many a times our patients come when they have uh, an established inflammatory bowel disease because the chronic uh, latent infections have lasted for a long, for the longest period of time to damage their uh, gut lining and gut microbiome. Rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, psoriasis. These are some of the most common diseases that we come across. Next, please. So there's this paper which talks about connection between gut micro microbes and metabolic disorders. So as per this, uh, 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 can you see, can you hear? Uh, yeah, uh, I'll just have to, you just have to give me a moment. I'll have to connect my device to um, the uh, power point. Just give me a moment. Yeah, 15 minutes to go. Yeah. yeah sure. Yes, please. Attendees, yeah, uh, so we were here. Yes, uh, am I audible? Yes, you're audible, ma'am. Please go ahead. All right, 
so the gut microbiota is essential for physiological function energy extraction and immune system control and imbalances in the gut microbiota can lead to metabolic disorders gastrointestinal disorders and cancers so the gut microbiota can impact lipid accumulation lipopolysaccharide content which is a very important key player uh, when it gets uh, it crosses the gut um, barrier and uh, it goes into the blood stream can lead to a lot of uh inflammatory reactions and production of short chain fatty acids very important for healthy microbiome to uh, uh to be kept healthy in our gut uh, so uh, this uh, they affect inflammatory tone food uh, intake insulin signaling and multiple meta metabolic perspectives next please so when the microbiome gut lining brain and immune system they work together in harmony uh, then they do the following they fight infections they balance the immune system they cool off inflammation they improve digestion and regularity they prevent food sensitivities they prevent autoimmune disease they promote t regulatory cells which calm the immune system next please so how do i diagnose so we have multiple ways i think we all know um, that uh, we can do comprehensive stool analysis we can do gi mapping we can do um, gut, uh, we can do different kind of gut microbiome testings uh, and we can identify multiple um, markers which can basically you know, lead us to uh, to understand and firm up a protocol um, of treatment we also uh, thankfully we have um, functional medicine investigations available nowadays which can tell us the kind of uh, sensitivity that these infections have against the antibiotics as well as against the uh, nutraceuticals that can be given to our patients for a long period of time and we can work with them on uh, cleaning their gastrointestinal system cleaning the uh, removing the biofilms which are formed over a period of time and um, of course supporting them with digestive enzymes uh, uh, so i heard dr ashwini's uh, presentation on uh, uh enzymes and it was really in interesting and insightful you know because uh, uh yes uh, uh, so far so far i had been always giving enzymes to my patients but never specified that it should be given before uh, meals and now i i agree on this that yes if we give before meals it could do a lot of cleansing apart from of course uh, uh, you know taking care of uh, the digestion uh so next please next slide so these are the inflammatory markers which i often look at when i uh, check my patients uh, uh, these uh, tests uh, results lactoferrin is a biomarker of serious gi inflammation associated with inflammatory bowel disease uh, such as ulcerative colitis and crohn's disease then calprotectin very important which helps me differentiate between ibs or ibd uh, how intense my treatment has to be is defined by this marker um pcal calprotectin a protein biomarker found in stool is used to diagnose and monitor inflammatory bowel disease such as crohn's and ulcerative colitis by assessing inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract lysozyme is a biomarker of an inflammatory immune system, uh, response in the gut then secretory iga is secreted by mucosal tissue and represents the first line of defense of gi mucosa and uh, and it's central to the normal function of gi tract as an auto as an immune barrier next please so like i said mentioned at the beginning of the presentation i i definitely want to add uh, how thymic uh, involution uh, has a role to play in development of these uh, diseases and how thymic peptides have been doing wonders to many of our patients you know i've been uh, i've been giving uh, to many of my patients and uh, we've had great results with these uh, so um, apart from boosting uh, immunity the t cell population uh, basically thymic peptides have multiple other roles to play um, in uh, healing so um, when there is a progressive thymic dysfunction and, and immuno essence occurs with aging and it results in increased susceptibility to infections increased autoimmune diseases increased cancer risk increased dysbiosis sibo ibs increase uh, increased thyroid dysfunction increased obesity diabetes uh, insulin resistance and depression anxiety bipolar migraines so they all set in as thymus uh, involutes next please this is a hypothetical uh, model so i'm just trying to uh, enlarge it so if you see how thymus involution is leading to 
the issues which are related to altered gut microbiome and uh, then age related decline in intestinal tissue function uh, altered hematopoietic output inflammaging and uh, so this is how the entire vicious cycle sets in next please So we talk about thymus briefly. Uh, it's responsible for producing and maturing lymphocytes or immune cells. Central lymphoid organ, it acts as a school for uh, T lymphocytes. That means it's training T lymphocytes to uh, do their uh, uh, job. Um, cells originating from the bone marrow reach thymus where they undergo selection, proliferation, and differentiation, and they get separated into two primary groups. One of these groups can recognize self-antigens which is uh, which are self reactive t cells and can destroy them uh, can destroy them and these cells are eliminated when our thymus is very active uh, the other group recognizes foreign antigens and can also destroy them and these cells remain alive and are participating so this is when our thymus is in uh, good health next please and as uh, we see uh, now t cells that bind too strongly to self antigen are negatively selected um, and meaning they undergo apoptosis to prevent autoimmunity. And T cells that undergo positive selection are the ones that weakly bind to self antigen, hence they receive a survival signal. So T cells that either cannot bind uh, or bind too strongly to self antigen are removed. Positive selection allows T cells to recognize antigens while negative selection prevents the development of T cells that might attack the body's own tissue. So mature T cells leave the thymus and enter the bloodstream where they can patrol the body and identify foreign invaders and initiate immune responses whenever needed. So thymus's role in T cell maturation as a vital component on the immune uh, dysfunction that we see in autoimmunity. Next, please. So the mechanism through which gut is Thymosis influences autoimmune disorder. So um, the gut epithelium is a efficient barrier, which we all know. Uh, so because when we are young, we have uh, efficient ba uh, barrier function of the gut epithelium and we do not have um, the leaky gap junctions to transfer these contents into the bloodstream. Uh, so this that prevents the absorption of lipopolysaccharides, structural changes to the intestinal epithelium in response to dietary alterations allows LPS to enter the bloodstream resulting in an increase uh, in the plasma level of LPS. And so this leads to endotoxemia and LPS activates stall -like receptor 4, leading to the production of numerous pro-inflammatory cytokines and hence low-grade systemic inflammation, which is, where, uh, which is how autoimmunity sets in. So thus metabolic endotoxemia can lead to severe chronic inflammatory conditions. Now I'm just gonna briefly talk about, because I can't go into the details, uh, because of the limitation of the time that we have. Uh, the common infections that we have been identifying in our patients, which are so commonly associated with autoimmune conditions, uh, one of them is H. pylori. Um, so H. pylori is a prevailing, uh, we've seen H. pylori very commonly in many of the patients, sometimes in latent state, sometimes it's active, no, but it resides, uh, especially associated with uh, people who take too many uh, anti-acids uh, because... Uh, uh, low acid level helps flourish uh, H. pylori. So prevailing evidence suggests an environmental trigger um, in a genetically susceptible individual triggers autoimmunity. H. pylori manages to survive in hostile environments and this gram-negative bacteria can cause molecular mimicry leading to autoimmune reactions. Next, please. There's a paper also. Uh, yes, please. Four minutes to go. Just, uh, just a reminder. Okay. Okay, okay, I'm just going to go quickly. So Klebsiella, I would definitely want to mention this uh, bacterial infection because this has been closely linked to ankylosing spondylitis. There are multiple papers which you can look for in this. So uh, I definitely like to check for Klebsiella pneumonia infection in my ankylosing spondylitis patients and then uh, treat them accordingly. Uh, it is produced and it also has molecular mim mimicry with HLA B27, which turns out positive in most uh, in many of these patients. Next, please. It's linked to ankylosing spondylitis and uh, and the HLA-B27 antigen is associated with AS. The HLA-B27 antigen cross-reacts with similar antigen found in certain microorganisms, including Klebsiella, 
which activates T cells that attack both the microorganisms and body's own tissue, leading to inflammation and fusion of joints, which is a key feature of AS. Next. Mycoplasma pneumonia, another infection. I wouldn't want to go deep into it, but it has been found to be associated in various papers uh, with rheumatoid arthritis. Next, please. Uh, this one needs a lot of attention. I um, uh, I'm somehow identifying so many of my patients, like 30 to 40 percent. I test 100 percent of my patients for this uh, infection, which is uh, Lyme disease. Uh, chronic Lyme disease is a big threat um, in today's time. We get patients who are, um, you know, spring from uh, multiple multiple symptoms, and sometimes if I find uh, them to be positive for Lyme, I'm I'm rather happy that, yes, I have a direction to go and I'll be able to really uh, give them a great result um, because it's a complex infection and um, it's caused by this bacteria, Borrelia, uh, Burgdorferi. And um, uh, in cases where Lyme disease has not promptly been diagnosed and treated, the infection may lead to chronic symptoms. So the mechanism basically includes an autoimmune reaction. Uh, and formation of immune complexes that would impact the nervous system. So primarily the symptoms which I find in these patients are of neurological origin. Uh, these could be even severe neuralgia like we see in post-COVID also. Many of our post-COVID patients, they come from severe neuralgia. So similar kind of a condition I've seen with chronic Lyme disease also. So the impact on mental health is suggested to occur through potential interactions with neurotransmitters. Hence, working with these patients is tricky as it takes long time for the immune system to get to the place where it can help detox uh, body of its of this antigen. Uh, but we, we have seen generally good results after um, six to nine months when we constantly treat our patients. Um, we find that uh, the level of antibody, antigen antibody complexes and the antibody level, it starts going down and patients, uh, they um, fare much better in terms of their symptoms. Next, please. Yeah, two minutes to go now. Yes, mold toxicity. So we all know about this. Uh, I think it's been discussed also multiple times. So this is also one of the underlying causes for autoimmunity. It releases eflatoxins and mycotoxins and they can uh, they have immunosuppressive and immunostimulatory effects. Next, please. So EBV, again, a very important infection, um, mostly goes undiagnosed uh, during COVID times. There has been exacerbation of uh, EBV also. There seems to be some connection, but it has been very closely associated with Hash Hashimoto's is what I have observed in my practice. Next, please. So these are some of the common conditions which are found associated with EBV infection, hepatitis, Hodgkin's, gastric can cancers, nasopharyngeal cancers, inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, Burkitt's lymphoma, herpes, and so on. Next, please. So what can damage the flora? Um, I'll very quickly go through these. Uh, we all know about these. Modern Western diet is a culprit, uh, has high processed carbohydrates, fat, sugar, and preservatives, and they result in thriving bad flora and difficulty for good flora to survive. Next, please. Antibiotic use, excessive antibiotics. I think we all know that the next threat after COVID, uh, which is surfacing, is the uh, superbugs and antibiotic resistance. And antibiotics are prescribed very loosely by our uh, conventional medical uh, practitioners. So I think there needs to be a check on that because they are causing more harm than good sometimes. Next, please. Yeah, 30 seconds. Um, yes, yeah. yes, I'm just going quickly. So chronic and acute illnesses and infections can damage gut bacteria and may require time to recover, even after the initial problem is treated. Next. Steroidal and oral contraceptive pill use. Next. Alcohol. Next, please. Stress. Very important. Lack of sleep. Another important factor. I think I'll end here. Thank you so much. Um, uh, team IFM, uh, IAFM, and uh, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kalpana. And uh, there are a lot of questions in terms of the gut. Uh, you could yeah. please take out some time, and uh, I request you to stay back and answer those questions in the chat box. Uh, it was a really wonderful session, and your insights on autoimmunity have always surprised people. Thank you so much for joining us. I her. agree with you, Karishma. Thanks, yeah. Kalpana. Thank, thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for thank this. You. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.